Good evening, everyone, uh, viewers, listeners alike. Uh, thank you for tuning in to the Steve Perryman podcast. As ever, we've got um, Howard. Welcome, Howard. Hi. And Tom, looking after the uh, the official side of things. How are you, Tom? Good, thanks. How are you, Steve? Yeah, great, great, great. Thank you. I, in fact, looking at myself, I look a bit red, and people might be thinking that I was on the bottle um, watching the game last night. I can assure you I'm not, but felt like it. So, um, so yeah, I expect we'll come on to that. Um, I want to ask you first both, what was your, the last game you watched live? I think we were both at the Liverpool game, weren't we, Howard? Yeah. Last yeah. Sunday. And I watched that on TV and it was, we were a touch unlucky, weren't we? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Could have gone, I mean, it, we didn't, we didn't tear up any trees of the performance, but at the same time, uh, Neither did Liverpool. We kept him at bay most of the time. I don't remember Lewis making a save in the second half. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, very, very unlucky not to get a penalty. Um, put a lot of pressure on. Another day, we could have uh, easily won that if it hadn't been for a, a couple of errors at the back as well. So, yeah, um, yeah frustrating. Howard, did you think it was a penalty? I thought it was, certainly. And, and um, I think it was pretty conclusive on TV later. But yeah. I think that I think that one was a penalty, and I think we had three or four that were pretty good shouts. It could easily have gone our way and didn't. Yeah, yeah. So so important. I mean, the fine margins, aren't they, that decide mm. these games? Fine margins. But uh, yeah, and of course Marseille, we've managed to get through. Yeah. Um, that was a close call. Yep. Very tight. Tom, how do you see that one? It's yeah. told. Yeah, so it's a similar story to so many games this this season, or particularly in the last couple of months, where the first half just felt like a bit of a non-event, unable yeah. to kind of control the ball, um, unable to really kind of make any headway at all. And then um, it seems like the shackles are off a bit in the second half. We played a lot better. Again, still not really hitting top gear, I don't think, but um, gave us a brilliant moment at the end. Um, that, you know, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing better than a kind of, Counter attack breakaway where you just know yeah. see your team swarming forward and then um, I kind of thought the chance had gone or at least wasn't going to be quite as easy as it was and then he absolutely Hoiberg with a great finish absolutely smashed yeah. it in so um, what, really um, and what a nearly great finish the one that hit the bar yeah what what good play that was yeah. so um, so yeah but but actually we're through aren't we 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 got to be happy with that. Um, yeah. As per this first half and second half situation, um, I'm going to give a speech tomorrow night uh, or depending upon when you're listening to this on Friday night at Sixfield Stadium, Northampton. And I do two halves. I do a talk for about three quarters of an hour, an hour, then a break and then the second half question and answers. So just to, because the, 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 audience will be Spurs supporters. I'm thinking of being very average for the first half, right. go into the a dressing room or go into a quiet room and give myself a good talking to, and then come out storming for the second half, just so they, they're all used all, to, isn't it? That's on, so we're all on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Won't be bad, will it? So then we have the next round. We are going to play AC Milan. Um, away first in February and then in March, the home leg. So memories of past encounters, Howard, in well, the, the first, Champions League. First one I remember that was, was AC Milan on that famous night in 1972. Yeah. Which um, we, you've mentioned many times as your best game. Yeah. I, wish it was, I wish it was Champions League. I was wrong there, Howard. It was UEFA Cup, of UEFA course. Cup. Yeah. So, um, so I'm not accused of being biased. Just tell me your thoughts of that. Uh, you didn't go to the away game, did you? Didn't go to the away game. I had to work. Um, so I was at home and we had dinner with my family, my family who had some friends around. And it was none of them were football people. So there wasn't football on TV. I had to find some obscure radio station that could keep me up with the scores. 
Yeah. But I, what, I, what I knew of it came with some later showings of it. We we had to dig in on that game, and we really did. We really did dig in. Yeah. We got the two great goals, and then the, the rest of the team were solid to get us through. Yeah. We could, when we get going with the second leg away, and it was slightly against us. Uh, but we were tough. We were a tough side then, and yeah, not not surprising that we won. Yeah, have you ever seen Alan Muller's goal? Yeah, that put us through. What a yeah. goal! Yeah. What a goal! Incredible. And bearing in mind, Muller's only came back off loan. Yeah, in like emergency um, yeah. situation. Um, so we'll brush over my two goals. Um, Tom, what about the AC Milan latest game? In the in the Champions League, yep. So it's in the um, I think it's the first knockout round in uh, 2011, in the 2010 2011 season. Um, and yeah, I didn't make it to the away to the away game, but I remember watching that, and uh, it was just we, yeah, we played out so well. We could have um, I remember in the first half, like we just started like um, really out of the blocks really quick and uh, put them under a lot of pressure, especially given how we'd. Um, kind of wilted at the San Siro in the first half in the first game we played there against Inter Milan earlier in the season um, in the famous Bale hat-trick second half yes. um, but um, but yeah uh, it was again talking about talking just now about breakaway goals 10 minutes to go I think um, Aaron Lennon just absolutely put on the afterburners and uh, crossed for um, Crouch to, to score so we took a 1-0 1-0 lead back to White Hart Lane and um, and the second leg was much more of a tense, tense affair. That I remember feeling so so nervous throughout most of that game, just fully aware that anything could happen, could change the whole complexion of the tie at any time. But um, but I think that was that was William Gallas's best game for Spurs. Um, not the yeah. most popular guy, but he. Do you remember that, was... Howard? Yeah. Remember Gallas being on his game? Yeah. Clearance off the line from Rubino's deflected shot. I remember. Um, kept us Rubinio, in. Rubinho, there's a there's a name. Yeah. But the other um, the the other guy who played really well for us that season, and it's a shame he never really progressed beyond, yeah, you know, progressive level. He, he looked like he was on a real up, up a trajectory towards was Sandro. Um, he was yeah. excellent in midfield that that season, and um, uh, in that game in particular. And obviously we uh, Junior and went through to the next round where um, unfortunately it didn't go quite so well against Real Madrid. But um, great a, a great couple of games. Yeah. That second game against Real Madrid, um, I can't, we can never, can never get to the bottom of it, but Peter Crouch was playing up front. He committed two blatant yellow card offences in the first 10 minutes and he mm-hmm. got sent off. Yeah. This is not what Peter Crouch does. He was, very wound, he was very wound up by all the very wound up. He yeah. wasn't known for bad discipline, was no, he? No, not at no. all. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. At yeah, least when I got sent off at Real Madrid, yeah. I I meant to do it. Yeah, it wasn't bad luck by any there means. Definitely no question about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've got a an AC Milan story for you. I recently have been to my local hospital in Bath for an MRI scan. I'm not going to go any further than that. Other than um, two people dealing with me, one English guy one foreign lady and I wore a Norwegian top and, and tracksuit trousers. So the chap said to me as I walked in, oh, have you been training or are you going training afterwards? No, no, no. He said, where's the top from? I said, oh, it's from, from Norway. So um, that got us on to various subjects. And eventually I said to the young lady who was asking me all the questions about have I got any metal in my body, in, in my on my clothes um i said where are you from she said milano ah nice okay i've been to milan and it got round to why were you there and I, I i played football and i i played there so i eventually go into the mri and 40 minutes later i come out and i'm told that the pair of them had been watching my two goals against ac milan they had to work out Stephen could be Steve and they got me up <laughs> on the screen and they're watching me score two goals while I'm I'm, there you were. I'm singing in the MRI machine 
There you were so, thinking they were looking at a screen with the MRI on it. Yeah, I yeah, thought they, they were looking but... for, for some problem, yeah. but uh, of course not. So, um, you know, the fact that I did score those two goals, I might even get an invite to the AC Milan game. Wow. I would prefer it in Milan. Yes. But actually, at, at the new stadium would be quite nice. So the last time I went to Milan, I went with a Swedish group and we went to the Milan derby. Fantastic occasion. The problem was we were so high up in the gods that um, couldn't really see much. But we stayed in a place called Bergamo. Bergamo. Uh, I think yeah. we flew into whatever the airport's called there. I suppose it's a bit like flying into Luton for Heathrow. Yeah. When you think you're in London, but you're in Luton. Uh, and it was a one hour train ride uh, into Milan for the game. But, um, but yeah, a fun group of Swedish and uh, we enjoyed ourselves. So, um, so yeah, that was my last visit to Milan. And if I go back to Milan, invited by somebody, maybe we should go chaps. Um, then I would be looking to, to pay a visit to Bergamo again because I love that place it was a mm. fantastic uh, city there's an old walled city there and um, if any of you have been there you you certainly won't forget it yeah. so um, on to the next one uh, Knott's Forest last night particularly particularly disappointing um, as I said I didn't put me on the drink but close to it um have you recovered yet, Howard, from that game? No, I was very depressed by that because we just didn't seem to show anything. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, what am I going to say in the podcast this evening? Because there's got to be somebody that lifted the team or something that happened. And it felt like there was nothing. Yeah. We certainly yeah. didn't think when we got back to one, when we won down or two down that we could come back to where we have in previous, you know, the rest of this season. Didn't and look you, like it. No. Nah. Didn't look like it. Yeah, at all. The player that I sort of highlight as per looking for something good out of it, um, I thought the goalkeeper did okay. Yeah. I don't think he, he had any chance with the goals, etc. Everything actually was straight at him. Yeah. And he and he dealt with it. But um Benton Core, I thought, showed that he cares. Yeah. If somebody kicks his teammate, he cares. If he gives the ball away. He cares enough to want to get it yeah. back. Um, did you have the same feeling as us, Tom? Were you disappointed or worse than that? Yeah, it was woeful, really, wasn't it? I mean, um, again, terrible first half. Uh, and this time we didn't get the second half to, to balance it out either. Um, the one you mentioned, you mentioned Forster had a, had, had a pretty good game, but... Um, I think the one positive for me, and again, it wasn't even that much positive, but seeing seeing half an hour of Jed Spence, um, sure, sure, and and he he certainly looks like he wants to make things happen. Um, yeah, he, he had a very good header on target. He yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He just he just wants to take players on, and you know, you just think what you know what he just offers. He he at least offers something which is more than Emerson. Royale does at the moment, and um, I did. I felt a bit sorry for Emerson Royale against Liverpool because the crowd really got on his back when um, when when he was sending a few of his crosses into into orbit. But um, it's I know he's I know he's solid, reasonably solid at the back, can do a job in Conte's system, whatever we want to say about it. But yeah, but in terms of actually making something happen on from a wing back position, he, he's just not offering anything. Whereas Spence, in the very very small amount of time I've seen him play for Spurs at least wants to drive forward and and, and do something. So, yeah, um, it does. He looks like a free runner, doesn't he? Yeah. He's a free moving, free runner with or without the ball. It looks very positive in his in his in his body language, which I like. So um I mean of course ninety five percent of us supporters would pick him without really seeing too much of him. But yeah. But uh, you know the test is coming at some point, surely, yeah. because the squad is going to be tested with, with okay, we're out of the league cup, but there's other cups to be concentrating on. So, and of course, it's an important league season as well. Let's not forget about that. 
Our, I think near, Spurs... na our near neighbours are doing particularly well and we can't let them run away from us, can we? Yeah. Uh, I think, go, just going back to Spence, I think Spurs... I mean, the, the, the one thing I try and remind myself is that Spurs fans are often obsessed with the players who aren't playing. And yes, yeah, I agree with that. See, want to see them. And and it's been like that ever since I've been a bit been been young following the team. And um, you know, I remember like back in the day, like, oh, I really want to see more of Willem Corston or um uh, you yeah, know, in the late nineties in the late nineties or um Yeah, you know, God yeah. Who else. But 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 you know, the manager sees what, what these guys are like and in the training pitch each day. And and it was only three or four years ago we were absolutely clamoring for Troy Parrott to get an extended run in the team and um and and you know, he hasn't Exactly, yeah. been tearing up trees, trees since. So, yeah, as much as we'd like to see him do well, mm. so um, I try to remind myself of that. But every time I see Emerson balloon another cross into into the stands, I'm just or just floating over the the attackers lining up. Yeah, then you do just feel a bit. Oh God, imagine what we could do if we did have that kind of quality coming in mm. from the from the wing backs. Yeah, are you losing a bit of faith in Conte Howard? I hate to say that I am, but. Yes, I am. I mean, the latter part of last season, we were playing very good football. We were dominating teams. And we the run we had got us into the Champions League. And you could have, you could have done a, a um, count amongst all the other premiership managers. Say, who's going to finish highest, Spurs or Arsenal this season? Before the season, everyone would have said us. That was, yep. The reality is the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good situation. I um I just want to mention the first goal. Um, I have this thing about one against one on the last line of defence. Mm -hmm. Sanchez, if you stand between the ball and the goal, that means, although that sounds like the best position, it's not. There's no real plan. You cannot stop the opponent going either side of you. Whereas if you come inside the line of between the ball and the goal, you're showing the, the, the opponent sort of wide of goal, or at least it's a plan. And if you get beaten, if you get beaten, at least the goalkeeper knows where it's coming from. Um, I think he, he, we conceded two goals in foreign opposition on a particularly bad night that he conceded in the same way, got done inside, and then finish. And um, it disappoints you when you see the same mistake cropping up again. Yeah. It's no plan. It's average defending. And you know, if he wants to, if he wants to be a, a first eleven pick, he's going to have to do better at situations like that. And. Of course, it's a responsibility of the goalkeeper, but it's also a responsibility of the, the manager's plan for how to defend. That Ray Clements always used to say to me, Steve, I would much rather deal with a cross than a shot. So he's then putting his, mm. putting his name on my decision how to defend. And uh, of course, to do right by him, I would show a player wide rather than letting him come inside and have the whole goal to shoot at. So, um, yeah, particularly disappointing when it's a, a mistake that's happened before. So um, let's try and sort of eradicate those. So a couple of things happened this week. Uh, Martin Peters would have been 79 years of age. God bless him. Um, Howard, some memories of, of Martin, please. Martin is a great player. It was tough on him that he t he replaced Jimmy Greaves effectively because yeah. he swapped, swapped clubs, but that wasn't it wasn't his fault. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he was a great player, made great late runs into the box, and was always scoring at least the tens and twenties every season. Yeah, um, he was perhaps unfairly treated as, as if he wasn't tough enough, but in fact he was. I mean, he needed yeah. to his foot, and he did. Yeah. Uh, uh, particularly nice man. You maybe think he was a bit too nice, Howard, to be a manager. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I think he was a thinking footballer. Sounds yes. strange to say that. But while the rest of us is, are hurry scurrying around, doing the work that obviously someone's got to do, Martin was a step back and look 
and pick the right time. As per some supporters' comments, I think he felt that he could pinch the ball out of a 50-50 uh, yeah. tackle, and which he, he did. He accomplished that a number of times. But if it didn't come off, it sort of looked like he wasn't being strong enough or committed enough to the tackle. And I think maybe that that sent various supporters a certain way on their thinking of him. But what an attacking uh, threat on the opponent's goal while arriving in the box. Yeah. Um, and you have some comment about being named 10 years ahead of his time, Howard. Alf Ramsey was uh, kept at Martin in the team all the time, the England team. And he thought he was def defending him by saying uh, 10 years ahead of his time. Well, in fact, it meant was the, the new the column writers in the papers had a wonderful get gift of 10, 10 years ahead of his time that they can quote against anything. So it didn't certainly didn't do him any favours. Didn't do him any favours for sure, but very, very nice guy. Lovely family and uh, sorely missed. John Duncan got buried um, yeah. last week and Ozzy and Pat Jennings represented the club at his funeral, doing a great job. Uh, Ozzy as ambassador, Pat as uh, as a as a ex colleague. Um, that that funeral was in Chesterfield, so they deserve credit for for the journey up there. And of course, um, we've got the World Cup to look forward to. And Harry and Eric have been picked, and we've got two in the Welsh squad. Um, Tom. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, Gareth, uh, Gareth Bale, I wish. Um, ben Davies and Joe Roden are in the um, English team. Uh, God, sorry. Welsh this week. Welsh in the team. Welsh team. In the Welsh team, even though we forget Joe Roden is, uh, is still a Spurs player officially. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, good luck to him. I'm not sure I'm going to be watching too much of it, to be honest. But... Well, I have the same feeling as that, Tom. I, I have no interest whatsoever in this World Cup. I think it's completely out of order, being messing up our season. I really do. And um, I think international football has gone such a, a, a distance away from being normal or regular that, of course, this is the World Cup, but there's so many games England play, you're not quite sure what competition it's in. Yeah. So you lose a little bit of where, where where does this stand? Where does this put us? If we if we win it, what what happens to us? So um, yeah, I'm 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 not particularly looking forward to this World Cup. I think everybody but, says that. But I, my, my my comment is that but if England do well and progress through the tournament, we'll all then, change. Yeah. It will all change, and and we'll be doing a podcast about it, Howard. That's yeah, what we'll be doing. We'll yeah. we'll turn. We'll do a complete U-turn, which has been happening in this country lately. A complete U-turn, and um, yeah, we might. They might just win us over. Put it that way. Yeah. Um, do you think that the the World Cup has influenced our players with their performances, or in general? I, I, I think, haven't really noticed it. Mm. Well, yeah. I thought Harry looked particularly leggy the other yeah, night. Yeah, yeah. particularly yeah. leggy. Conte said yesterday how tired Harry was and that he had to almost like drag him to play last night, given that there were no other fit strikers ready to. Yeah, so that says something about our, our limited squad, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. So, so yeah. So um, I went to Bergen. For a visit, I think I mentioned that last time on the on the podcast. Bergen was brilliant, fantastic. Three hundred days rain a year, <laughs> and in the five days that we were there, not one drop of rain. So I think I'm just being lucky. Uh, myself and Kim had a great time. Um, unfortunately, Howard and Vivian and my other friends could couldn't make it, but uh, they missed a, a good uh, a good five day break. But we're going to do it again, Howard. Probably in May time on there. Um, sounds a good idea about May time. <laughs> yeah, National Day. National Day, May 17th. Right. So, um, and as I said earlier, I'm in Northampton talking on Friday night. You might be listening to this during Friday afternoon. I'm not suggesting anyone's going to up and leave where they are to come and listen. But I was thinking about the era that I played in. And this was off the back of the disappointment 
um, in the Nottingham Forest game. Life was so much easier in my era. Did you play for the club or the manager? There was no such thing. The manager was the club. He was the club. And there was no one in between you. There was no agents. There was no voice of uh, social media clamoring for someone to play or someone to be left out. It was the manager's right, his role to manage you. No one was in between you, no agents. And um, I think that was much simpler times. So you either played for Bill Nick, you played, you sang his tune, or you left. And that's the way it was. But life seems so, so complicated these days for footballers. And lots of moving parts. Lots of moving parts and lots of rumour and lots of intrigue and lots of stories and and doubts put in people's head. So um, I, I come back to it so delighted that I played in the era that I did. And um, for those listening out there, particularly the club people, I would really like an invite to the Milan game. It would... It would be quite fitting, I think, the, the fact I scored the two goals. So um, hopefully someone does that for us on the night or the nights against AC Milan. So thank you, chaps, for your involvement. Um, we'll see you soon. And I'm coming to the Leeds game. Hopefully I'll see you both there. Yep. I'm see you there. I'm going to be in some restaurant uh, with a very nice couple that invited me from... Um, used to be in the old Steve Perriman lounge if people yeah. remember those days mm-hmm. um, Vince and Julie so thank you for the invite you two and yeah come on you Spurs we need it we need a result and we need a performance this weekend don't we before we all pack our bags and get out to Qatar and uh, no no <laughs> definitely not so anyway thanks chaps great to see you thank you and uh, come guys. on you Spurs <laughs> <laughs>